Hello, everyone. Welcome to Stream and Hub Radio. I am Sage Stevens, the host of Shout Out with Sage. My guest today is a filmmaker with an upcoming film entitled Mary Pickford, Love Wild. This is her second feature film. Her first one debuted at Tribeca Film Festival. The film with Mary, about Mary Pickford was shot by the late Dan Neese, who worked with David Lynch for over 20 years. It stars Carrie Elwes, Luke Arnold, Althusar Getty, Scott Hayes, and Sophia Kennedy Clark as Mary Pickford. She has directed several award-winning music videos, and I want to welcome to the show today, <laughs> Jennifer D'Elia. Hey, Jennifer, what's up? Hi, how are hey. you? Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for being here. So I was at your film screening last night at Paramount Studios. And how do you think it went? It was it was great. I mean, just to be on the lot, you know, where Mary Pickford worked uh, in the early days in the 19 teens and where I had my first job in uh, 1997 when I first moved to L.A. as a teenager to pursue my career and like just all that energy converging from these different eras and timelines. It's just really powerful. And then hearing, you know, people's feedback to the film, it's, uh, it's not a conventional biopic. It's very <laughs> much in the surrealism art vein. Right. It's very Alice in Wonderland and yeah, very, um, and, and you act in it as well. How did that come about for you? Like, did, did you always think you were going to act in it or did that come just about through the process? Definitely through the process. Mm -hmm. um, I was not originally seeing myself visually in the film. Um, it's as it evolved, it just became more and more personal, this connection mm -hmm. with Mary and just the archetypal artist muse uh, mm -hmm. connection. Okay. There's a line in the movie that says, is there such thing as a as a biography or, or simply a projection of the artist telling the story? You know, you don't really know whose story it is. Um, I see life like that. So as it evolved into this sort of meta experiential thing, um, it just felt like something was missing. And Pickford was really into exploring uh, multiplicity and quantum physics and things like that too. So it's very, very aligned. And then the early days of cinema were very avant-garde and surrealist. So it was just kind of pulling from that and I was channeling her. So I channeled right. well, her. Yeah. 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 Cause like back then, especially too, they still thought actors were sort of charlatans and, you know, it wasn't a, a career. Well, I mean, even now some people <laughs> don't, don't think yeah. much of it, but but definitely worse back then. And why Mary Pickford? Why did you decide to do a picture about her? Uh, I discovered her uh, magically in an art exhibit in Toronto, where she's from. Right. And I just had this visceral, like literal shockwave come through my body, almost like a love at first sight or discovering a kindred spirit. And uh, I just knew it was instant instant mm -hmm. like we i have to tell that story i don't know what the story is but it just was a knowing like a deep right. wisdom kind of feeling so right. yeah yeah I, I met you at afm and we were talking and then you know you mentioned you had the mary pickford and i'm you know i'm a native of canada and so like i knew she was canadian i, ba I basically know you know any actor or filmmaker that's canadian i probably know who they are <laughs> Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And so that's how we started talking. And then I'm like, oh, wow, that's like so great. Cause I have a, I have a big affection for her as well. Why, like, what was it about her that really resonated with you? I mean, at the onset, at the onset, it was just an energy, uh, kind of her aura. Um, mm -hmm. As I got, you know, into the rabbit hole of her tangible story, it was um, just this feeling of having, kind of like a sister or mm -hmm. a role model or a best friend like this. I'd always kind of felt like an alien in mm -hmm. growing up and then also in the industry coming up because I was just such a kind of go getter and I didn't have any connections to the industry. I moved to LA at 17 without the support mm -hmm. of my family and 
I was pioneering. I realized this path and I never had a mentor. I never had anyone showing me what to do and just intuitively had to find my way and use my street smarts and things like that. And so when I discovered Pickford as the pioneer, right. um, I was like, oh, wow, somebody that gets it. And not to put myself on the same plane as her, but it's more of a, just this energetic feeling of somebody very aligned values wise. And uh, I'd, I'd met amazing people along the way and had many connections and things and deep ones, but nothing so palpable as with her. Well, yeah. she 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 accomplished so much. Like she what she produced her film. She, you know, she was very active in the whole process and created a studio. So I mean, you know more of the specifics than I do, and you probably can tell the story better. But um, I mean, she was like very business minded. So why don't you tell us a bit about that? Her business sense. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean that that was sort of the the connecting point is that it was intuitive for her. You know, mm -hmm. there was nobody to show her the ropes. Uh, she commanded her worth coming from a family where she played um, a very interesting role, which was very paternal mm -hmm. amongst her mom and her siblings. Once their dad left when she was about four, mm -hmm. she stepped into this role of, of I will keep the family together. And they, you know, they were in poverty and struggling and she wanted to be the glue and and fill that void of a paternal figure. So she used a lot of her masculine to understand her negotiating power and her value and also didn't diminish her feminine power, which I just find incredibly integrated and, and beautiful. Um, so she really just, she just commanded it, you know, she didn't have any, any sense of money, except that she knew she wanted it. She knew that it would make life easier for her, easier for her family, easier for artists that she wanted to support. She wanted to infuse the industry with funds for artists that were struggling. I mean, so she was motivated by this desire to create security for beings across the board and she just had a fearlessness about going for it. So she was a businesswoman. She was the first woman to earn a million dollars in North America in a year. Mm -hmm. um, and she was running Hollywood, really, for a, for a bit. Yeah. yeah. Tell us more about how she got together with Charlie Chaplin and Griffith and all of that stuff. <laughs> um, she met Griffith in New York because she was uh, needing to support her family and she was in small roles on Broadway coming out of vaudeville theater and her mom encouraged her to go meet Griffith to get job, get a job on what they called flick flickers at the time. They were just little short films that were a few minutes long and, it was embarrassing. It was considered what they called a step above prostitution to work on oh, movies yeah. was like a very kind of disrespected job. Mm -hmm. And it was just to support the family. And um, so that was her entrance into that world. And then she, you know, discovered it was an art form and that she started to fall in love with it. And the, the rest is sort of history there. Um with Chaplin, they were kind of coming up at the same time. It took a little bit for them to converge. Um, and he was best friends with Fairbanks, who was the love of her life. And they had started their affair and their interaction. And um, this was in L.A. And they all joined forces to create United Artists so that they could have control of the, the creative and the money. You know, But they really put themselves as artists first before they put themselves as business people. But in order to have creative freedom, sometimes yes. you have to be the business person too. So yes, definitely. Well, it's called show business, not show friends. So right there you go. There you go. With Fairbanks, I mean, they were both married, correct? In the beginning, they were both married. Yeah. Yes. So especially back then, that was like so taboo. And it, I'm just tell us more about that. I, I just find it so interesting that I mean, she's she was really like avant garde for the time. Very avant-garde. Yeah. I mean, you know, the heart's the heart and they fell in love with each other. Um, I think that's universal and timeless and it happened. And um, 
it had it was unprecedented. They were the first, mm -hmm. you know, publicly scrutinized love affair in so-called Hollywood. And uh, you know, there was a lot of drama and things that ensued during World War One, you know, with the press starting to come out about them and stuff. Um, but essentially they decided to follow their hearts, even if it meant losing their career. And they did and they stepped out and they got divorced from their significant others and they became the first Hollywood royalty couple. It was quite the opposite of losing their career. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, their sort of radical transparency, I think, amplified their yes. position in, in society and also created what she deemed to be a curse, which is the invasion of the private life okay. and, you know, actors in the spot in the limelight. Uh, feeling like they need to share what's going on with themselves privately. And she, she eventually didn't like that, mm -hmm. but there was no one before her and she didn't know how to handle it. And so she just, you know, thus is celebrity. It was the birth of celebrity. Yeah. Right. What is your creative process? Like, how do you, do you write first? Do you get visual images first? Do you think of it as a director or a writer? Um, I don't necessarily know that I separate the lenses. Okay. Um, it, I mean, with this project, yeah, I just, it was kind of hand in hand. I, I get a lot of visuals and downloads in my meditations and my dreams and my thought process. Um, but I've been a writer since I was a child. That was my first right. strength and passion. Um, so yeah, that all kind of comes naturally, but the visuals really excite me so much. Do you see the film visually? Like, do you storyboard it at all? Um, did I storyboard this one? Uh, yeah, there was some vision boards and storyboards. I mean, nothing super regimented, but there would be at different points in the process, some visual representation that would create like an essence for us to draw from, but nothing rigid or literal. Okay. With your casting, did you have people in mind? Did you use a casting director? How did all that come together for you? Uh, the first round of casting during development. Um, no, my producing partner, Julie, and I went directly to agents and we cast the movie that way with the script. Uh, and that entire cast ended up pretty much not being in the film because <laughs> development took five years. And by the time we were shooting, right. it was a scheduling thing or something. Uh, and then, of course, it lands where it's supposed to. We, we ended up with the cast we were meant to have. And, um, and we did work with a casting director in the end. And um, some people I had in mind, some people she suggested. Sophie Kennedy Clark. Uh, was suggested by the casting director, but I had seen her in Philomena mm -hmm. playing the young Judy Dench and in Lars von Trier's films. And she was this budding uh, British star. And I knew who she was, but I didn't know her name. So it was very mm -hmm. exciting to connect with her. Um, so yeah, it was a mix of things, you know. How long did it take you to get this film done again? <laughs> Um, from beginning been, to end. Yeah. Well, this has been 12 years in the making. So the first few years I was still finishing my first film and I directed a play with Julia Stiles off Broadway and there was like overlap with other projects. Right. But as far as like writing the script, raising the money, producing it, getting it into production, editing it, <laughs> realizing that I wanted to shoot more and re-editing it and being where we are today... Yeah, it's been a 12 year journey, but it's uh, been quite fruitful. Okay, so you said that you shot it and then did some edit and then you felt like it was missing something. And so you, what, yeah. was, it miss, what was it missing? What did you feel at that time? The layer that I'm in, which is the, mm -hmm. the meta, the more meta component to it, mm -hmm. uh, just felt strongly like it needed to be there i was hoping it was our it was there more subversively um mm -hmm. but it wasn't i had more to just kind of get out of my system and all of that so we went back into production and shot that footage on the stage at united artists at mary pickford's 
creation, okay. the theater oh, wow. that she birthed in 1927 that's in downtown LA. We mm-hmm. actually shot that footage there and that was really special. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. How did the financing come? Like, did you have like one financer? Did you piece it together? Did you get grants? How did all that come? Uh, we have one main equity financier and then other players as well that put in smaller pieces and have smaller shares, but it, it's, right. it's a group of people. Right. Was that difficult for you? Like, did you really have to pitch it or was everybody just sort of on board to begin with? Um, I mean, it's challenging to raise money. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it was, it was hard, very hard. Yeah. Um, some, some, some were easier than others. Some moments were a lot more graceful and easeful and others felt a little bit more like a battle, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's par for the course when you really commit to something that needs to be independent in order to preserve the integrity, I think. It's uh, it was important to go through that process. What inspired you to to go in that like sort of metaphysical, you know, Alice in Wonderland voyage? It's just how I see life. So I couldn't really imagine it another way. You know, I'm I'm I see life in this way, and then I also understand that Mary Pickford was seeing life in that way. And so it was just important that that's there, that time is sort of a field of, you know, simultaneous events and we're exploring alter ego and we're exploring different dimensions and we're exploring portals and um, multi-sensory and experimenting and pushing the medium and playing with sacred geometry and, um, Okay, wait, what is sacred geometry? I don't know what sacred geometry is. Sacred geometry is apparently the makings of the universe, which is, you know, in in quantum physics and ancient text, uh, it's shapes and patterns, you know, like the kaleidoscope shapes that would appear in the film. Right, yeah, that was really beautiful, yeah. It's very much like the fractals or molecules that make up the universe and everything's kind of like reverberating as these pattern structures. And so her and like Einstein and all those artists of the time, they would talk about these things and it's very psychedelic. During the process, because it took so long and like, I'm sure you were editing stuff along the way when you showed it to other people, how do you differentiate like your vision for it and not, have other people affect what you want to do um, or do you, or do you let them affect you or like, <laughs> how do you, how do you do that? I mean, it's a dance. There's times when I feel it's important to be open to feedback and make sure that I'm not compromising the vision. But if somebody's mm-hmm. giving me feedback, that's elevating my vision mm-hmm. um, or there's something I'm missing, you know, I just want the movie to be amazing I'm open. And then there's times where it's important for me to stay in my lane and not be open and keep (laughs) people out of the edit and just understand that I need to have a process or I'll never get done. Right. Um, So it's a dance and there's a navigation system to that for me, but I've had producers that have really respected when I call them in, when I don't call them in and then, you know, showing an audience and like 2019, I premiered the film for a thousand people. I thought I was done. So you know, kind of seeing the feedback there and realizing that I wasn't done was coming from my heart and also a lot from the collective, you know? So you did the screening and what was the feedback? Like, so from that, you just decided I need to do more. It wasn't from, I I viscerally felt already like something was missing, but then hearing the feedback from that night, it validated. Mm -hmm. Um, People were, saying that it was a beautiful art film. And my first film was a beautiful art film. And Mm -hmm. I'm happy to make a beautiful art film. But I really felt strongly that this film wanted to be more the bridge between art and commerce, like kind of like Pickford. And so I want art, 
but art that can be commercial. Right. This particular piece. <laughs> and as we got more into the meta and as time goes on with the zeitgeist, it's like wine. It kind of ages where more and more people get it, more and more people are asking for it. Kind of like that film, Everything, Everywhere. Yeah, all at once. That was. Yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, whatever the title was. Yeah. I didn't see it, but people will look at my film, and I'm sure it looks very different, but they've been telling me that it reminds them. There's something in the energy of it. So I think people are hungry for this nonlinear, experiential yeah. experience. And I think so. as time has been going on, the film's becoming more relevant. So... Mm -hmm. That's exciting. What made you decide to act in it? Sort of the same elements of feeling like something was missing and then going into casting for that role and then having somebody say to me, why are you casting somebody to do what you're living? Okay. And I was like, yeah, it was kind of, an interesting thing to look at because I had been a performer. I hadn't been seeking that role in this right. process, but it wasn't a foreign concept. So mm -hmm. once I took that in and internalized it, I was like, yeah, nobody's going to be able to channel her the way that I am. They would do it in their own beautiful way. But what I was experiencing over these years is what I was harnessing in the, in that cathartic release that I'm going through in the movie, which is like very real. Yeah. How did the opportunity to work with your cinematographer come about for you? Um, very serendipitously. Mm -hmm. I had just seen uh, blue velvet, the David Lynch film on the big screen for the first time in New York at the film forum. And I was interviewing a potential new assistant like a few weeks later in LA right. to work with me in New York. That's where I was based. And she said her last job on her resume was for, was with Dan Neese mm -hmm. who did steady cam for blue velvet. And I had just seen that on the big screen and I was like blown away by it. And the whole movie is steady cam. So mm -hmm. that was all him. And I was just like, no way I got to meet that guy. She's like, oh, really? I can introduce you. And she did. And then we hit it off creatively. And he read the script and the rest is history. Yeah. Was he involved in it from the very beginning? Yeah. Like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. He shot okay. my foot to all of it. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And how did the rest of the um, crew, I met your, your lighting Dwight yes. last night and we were, we talked a lot about the lighting. So why don't we sort of, uh, talk about like, how did you decide what type of tone you wanted? Uh, in my visions, I would just see the way shadows and colors and things would come to life and I would express it to Dan and then he would help translate it to Dwight and then Dwight would show us something and then we just collaborated in this very artistic way. I remember Dwight saying within the first couple of days how grateful he was for his whole career, but this was the first time he felt like he exercised his craft as an artist on set oh. and like uh, in like 20 years. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. We were talking last night and he was saying how um, there were times on set where it just felt really like magical and organic and everything. And, you know, throughout the whole conversation, yeah, I was like super excited and really happy about what you guys have accomplished. Has there been anyone else in uh, either in this movie or in your career that's really helped you and guided you? So, not in that conventional mentor kind of a way, but I've definitely been inspired by people along the way um, in, in a variety of, of ways. You know, I worked on a Wong Kar Wai movie when I was coming up in production as a coordinator and it was his first American film. And it had Natalie Portman and Nora Jones acting for the first time and Jude Law and this kind of all-star yeah. cast. Yeah. And all his producers came from China and had never produced an American film. 
So it was like the Wild West. <laughs> it was this kind of large cast and producers that didn't know how to produce in in this country with the unions and the things um, right. that we have. So as a coordinator and the production manager, we just got to basically step up and do all these things that we would not normally have gotten to do in terms of our responsibilities. And I just felt so grateful to have been thrust into something like that. I felt like I, again, I'm very intuitive and street smart and resourceful. So I got to exercise those muscles and just get stronger in my producing right. skills. Um, and my producing partner, Julie Pacino for, you know, 10 years or oh wow yeah oh wow <laughs> i actually mentored her technically um i'm 10 years older but yet i was so grateful for her support and like willingness to just jump in and do what it takes to get things done and um anyone that has that fire you know mm -hmm. i just get really inspired by and also inspired by people who i didn't want to be like that I got, to, <laughs> that I got to work for, and yeah. just learn those lessons and really retain them, and say I don't want a set where there's low camaraderie or it doesn't feel magical. Yeah. I want everyone, yeah. the caterer, the PAs, the actors, everyone yeah. to feel like they're in the picture, and that was really yeah. important to me. So it's just all been quite interesting and powerful. What would your biggest advice be to someone who wants to, you know, make a film? Um, to make a film, um, biggest advice would be. Yeah. So what, if someone's like, Hey Jen, I have this idea. I don't know where to start. How to, what would be the first step in, in getting my film done? For me, it was interning and just getting in the environment of um, observing and, like we said, learning what what resonates and what doesn't, and being willing to let that be a process rather than feeling like you have to like direct right away or something. Now, if it's somebody that has some experience and now they're ready to direct um, or write their first film, uh, I would say go for it. You know, like there's no formula. So just, just go whatever. for it and make sure it's a story you really want to tell. You know, it's just got to come from the heart as far as I'm concerned and have a, have a strong vision. And you want to live in that world for a while. You know, it's not about rushing it. If it's going to be okay. going to be good and genuine, then it's it needs time, you know. Cool. What's the biggest advice that someone's given you that you really thought was good or that you've used yourself? Um, just recently, this publicist we are considering working with, you know, really also encouraged me to remember to continue honoring the process mm -hmm. that, you know, I've come this far and this isn't the moment to rush anything. You know, having a partner for distribution that has the right set of values and the right constitution and is really going to honor this specialty film um, is important because I do have those moments where I just want to start shopping it and, <laughs> and get it out. Right. Right. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not shopping it. It's a very selective process and I, I want the right fit. And she kind of very pragmatically explained how we can execute um you know, magnetizing the right partner for this film. And it might be another year, you know? Okay. But it might not be, but just to like understand that that's okay. You said that you came to LA at like 19. What was your first, how did you find your first job? And what was, what did you think LA was going to be like when you first got here? I got here at 17. Sorry, 17. No, it's okay. It's okay. Right. It's, um, I got here at 17, and uh, I had been coming here somewhat growing up because I was living in Tucson, Arizona, and my grandmother was living in Santa Monica, so we would, you know, come visit her. And her, her friends owned the hair salon on the grounds of Paramount. 
Oh, wow. So okay. when I arrived in LA, I called that woman that was my grandma's friend and begged her to let me start getting my haircut there. <laughs> and at first she said no, actually. And then I, you know, begged her and, she, and convinced her. And I just walked around the lot one day and was like talking to people until I got a job, um, <laughs> essentially just wandering around the commissary. And it was an, an unpaid job at the Lisa right, Gibson right. talk show, but <laughs> it was the beginning, you know? And uh, I just knew LA was going to be an adventure. I, I felt such a calling to be a storyteller and a visual artist that there was no question about pursuing it. When did you decide sort of like, so I guess you were trying to work for other people. And when did you really decide that maybe that wasn't the path for you, like to work for other people being creative, but working for them versus, you know, doing something on your own with your own vision? I sort of kind of always knew um, I was freelancing. So I was, I came up through production. I was a production coordinator and I did things for features, documentaries, music videos, right. commercials. I sort of ran the gamut. Um, but once I started really writing my first script, uh, and I got bit by the bug of having creative freedom, I just knew that I wanted to start my own company. And so I did, and I met Julie and we were very committed to that independence. What was the biggest obstacle you had when you first started your company to get things going? Um, just fundraising. Right. Yeah. <laughs> always I mean, the money. It's always the money. <laughs> yeah. Like we managed to do it and we got everything we needed, but mm -hmm. it was just, it felt like we were spending the majority of our time doing that. Is there someone else in the future that you'd like to collaborate with? Um, so many people, I think. <laughs> um, I would, I mean, I, at this point, I would love to collaborate with a studio. Okay. I think that now that I've exercised my muscle as a creative, and I think that if I could be, you know, partnered with a studio and have that infrastructure behind me and like really get to sink my teeth into something with a huge budget based on my talent, not based on them sort of controlling the execution process. I think it would be really exciting. How important is networking to, to you or do you think to someone in the industry? I think it's essential. Um, you know, as you grow up, I think we all kind of treat it differently. Hopefully. I think in the early days for me, at least it was very much, number one priority. Uh, now it's different, you know, there's not such a hunger desperation to like connect and meet the right people. You know, you kind of, I kind of see the flow and it, things can happen very organically. Um, but connecting, connecting in, in a way. And for me, the human connection has always been important anyway, but the it's, it's it is a who you know and and how you're respected once you walk through the door kind of a, ga a game i guess well yeah like you want to connect with the right people and with people that believe in you and you know have the same vision i mean obviously it's probably not going to work out very well if none of those things are in place yeah and it does happen a lot you know that's how people get a lot of things done is they're not that connected but mm -hmm. i think that comes through in the alchemy of the content how do you decide what to say yes to as far as a project versus, you know, what you say no to? Because in L.A., I find, you know, you're always bombarded by people saying, oh, we should do this. Oh, we should do that. And how do you decide? Um, I just generally say no to most things. <laughs> I'm just not like I'm getting hit up constantly, but I've just for so long been in the throes of the projects that I've chosen myself. So I don't have, I haven't given myself much space to say yes to things outside hmm. of, you know, the first film, this film, the theater I directed, the music videos, the things that 
I just felt very aligned with. So I just read a script recently for myself as a director that's somebody else's script and it was a no, you know. <laughs> You just didn't like the material. It just didn't. Yeah, there, it was just a lot of violence and a lot of yeah. kind of using spirituality as like a reason for things that I just I just wasn't aligned with. Right. Is there anything that you have said no to in the past that now looking back, you're like, oh, maybe I should have said yes to? No. No, you're, so. like yeah. you're, you're like definite. You're like, yeah. <laughs> you're you're de you're definitely uh, solid I mean, in your choices. Yeah, like I've had my doubts in in moments of weakness of just mm -hmm. not pursuing, you know, a studio for this film when we had the opportunity. Uh, but I wouldn't change anything because I wouldn't have gotten to make this movie, and so sometimes when it's hard with the money and hard with things, I'm like, Oh man, we could have just gone that easier pathway, but I know there would be just as many challenges. They just might be different. Mm -hmm. So in, in real terms, no, I don't wish there was something else I would have done. With the, with your film, what else do you have? Like, so you have that version that we saw last night what mm -hmm. else are you going are you doing a new, another edit are you going to be adding anything like no, what's the word? no i don't no, want you're, to you're, you're, i would like to you know credits and fine tuning the sound mix and things that will need to be done for distribution but mm -hmm. i'm i would like to cut the cord with my own sort of creative process on on this film after this film what's next um, to be determined. I, I think I know. And I think I'm starting to let that come through. It's a very large scale kind of multimedia live immersive okay. thing. Okay. Um, but also very meta, but dealing with myth. And um, yeah, we'll see how that develops. How do we find you on social media? Where do we go to like, see what you're up to? Um, I'm very inactive on social media, but I am present and it's, uh, called, uh, at love wild be free on Instagram and then Jennifer dot R dot Delia on Facebook. And I have a podcast as well called humanizing the icon that has 40 episodes on YouTube and Spotify and Apple and things. Um, what's that about? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, that was, I curated an exhibit at the Venice Biennale in Italy with artwork from the Pickford film in 2019 before COVID hit. And that was an amazing experience where I explored humanizing the icon from myth and spirituality all the way through pop culture. What is, what is icon? What is it to worship? What is all of this about? Um, that structure of something being larger than life. And why do we do that? And so the show developed out of that exhibit and those curiosities. And so I'd bring on, you know, visionaries and artists, and I'm sure similar guests to what you have and kind of deconstruct mm -hmm. these paradigms. And it would just go into all these different directions. And it was really fun. I haven't done an episode in a while, but it was a super <laughs> fun um, project. Yeah. It takes a lot of work to get all that stuff going and, and get guests and all that. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. And um, so you have, you don't have distribution or, I mean, so how do people find the film or when can they watch it? Or you don't really think, have any of those answers yet. <laughs> yeah. I think just stay tuned, you know, now it's, it's all about planting the seed. I think 2024 is our year. Uh, things are bubbling and I think it'll, it'll be known when that movie's hitting the circuit. It'll, it'll be okay. known. Yeah. Okay. okay. We're very excited for Pickford, Mary Pickford to have her debut into pop culture today. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. And um, thanks for inviting me last night. Yes. Had a great time. It was great to be uh, at Paramount and to watch your film and, you know, meet all your friends. It was like so cool. And the, the cast and the crew, it was like a really great time. So thank you for inviting me. Thanks for coming. I loved yeah. your energy there. I'm glad well, you enjoyed it. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us today and see you next time on Shout Out with Sage. So bye.
Bye, Jen. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank Bye, you. everyone. <laughs>